I'd like to talk to you today about the emerging field of neuroergonomics. Um, the context for that was set very nicely for when you come into this conference, uh, there's a large exhibit that says, the army is the soldier. I think that's a great slogan. Of course, the soldier doesn't operate in isolation. He works with his or her systems, and the machines and technologies, and those are increasing in, in complexity. And the goal of human factors or ergonomics has been to try and um, make that marriage more effective, humans and, and, and machines working together uh, if more effectively together. I have the next slide, please. And so that brings us to, to neuroergonomics. Um, you might say, well, I want to reach for my gun every time I see the prefix neuro applied to, to a new field like advertising or, or ergonomics. And I would, you know, uh, second that, that motion. In a sense, the term is not necessary, except to say that if we want to de design more effective human-machine systems, we must, of course, understand mind. Psychology, as the philosopher Mar Mario Bunge equipped many years ago, has been brainless and for many years. But neuroscience, which attempted to study the structure of the mind, was in a sense, mindless until very recently. So we need to bring those two approaches together. And so if we really need to understand mind, we have to study the brain. And so neuroergonomics is simply saying that in order to design more effective human-machine systems, we must include our understanding of neuroscience as just another tool to all of the other tools that we have to bring to, uh, to, the, to the table. And I can give you many, many examples. A recent book that Matt Rizzo and I wrote with the title Neuroergonomics, the Brain at Work, uh, outlines some of these. But I'll just describe two examples today. I have the next slide, please. Uh, I'll discuss the use of neuroimaging and adaptive automation to support operators who are supervising multiple unmanned vehicles. This is uh, a technology that is rapidly being introduced, not only in, in the military, but in many civilian applications, uh, starting, for example, with, with Katrina. Um, and then a second area that I will talk about is the use of molecular genetics to try and understand how individual differences in decision making, uh, in, particularly in, in a command and control setting, might be better understood. Next slide, please. So the first example considers the use of neuroimaging, particularly EEG and fMRI, to try and better understand how operators can cope with the load of supervising unmanned vehicles uh, while they have other jobs to, to, to uh, attend to as well. Next slide, please. This is taken from a, a, a somewhat older technical report that, that talks about the growth of robotic systems uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in the military. And what the graph shows is that as we are progressing to the year 2020, the degree of autonomy of robotic systems, unmanned vehicles, is going to increase. And this is going to mean reduced direct human control or te from teleoperation, uh, as indicated by the purple line. The green line shows what's called a mixed initiative or shared supervisory control, where both the human and the robot are part of a team. And a greater understanding of the mechanisms of supervisory control will accelerate the transition towards having greater autonomous capability uh, in, our, in our robotic systems. Next slide, please. So the soldier and the robot will form a team. And the, this goal, of course, is to try and enhance this team relationship, not only in terms of individual soldiers, but also groups of soldiers. The idea of introducing these unmanned vehicles is to in extend the manned capabilities um, and to provide greater tactical flexibility. But the problem is that unless there is a dedicated robotic operator who is only in charge of controlling the unmanned vehicles and doing nothing else, the amount of workload on the, on the operator is going to increase. Hence, we're going to need automated systems to decision-aiding system to support the operator in his or her task. Our approach has been that automation should be adaptive to the needs of the operator uh, and to provide help to the soldier when and where needed, but not intrude otherwise. Uh, and one way we can do this is to actually measure the neurocognitive state of the operator to decide when uh, that help might be required, or the operator him, himself may, may introduce uh, uh, that requirement. Next slide, please. 
this, this is concept of adaptive automation is that rather than having a fixed division of labor where the computer always does tasks A and B and the human does other tasks, that this sharing of, of responsibilities is flexible and context dependent. In other words, you know, I can delegate tasks to a computer or I might decide to take it over if I'm, uh, if I'm not very busy. On the other hand, if I'm overloaded, uh, and we can use uh, neuroscience measures, neural measures to determine when a, a soldier is overloaded or fatigued, we may, depending on the task context and other events that may occur, change the system, adapt the interface to provide more optimized user performance. Just to give you one example from a, a simulation study that we did, the next slide. This, this indicates when you might want to trigger and how you might want to do this adaptive automation. There may be certain critical events. All hell breaks loose on the battlefield. Uh, this might be a time to, to in introduce automated aids. There may be a particular part of the mission phase when you may want to introduce it. The operator performance, if, if it's substandard due to high workload or fatigue, uh, may be a, a, a way in which you may trigger adaptive automation. Uh, and you may also model the user. And one way to do this is to, is to actually assess operator neurocognitive states. Next slide, please. We've used a, uh, a simulation capability called the SIL, or Simulation Integration Lab. It just, just shows you, uh, this is simulating the work of a, of, a, of a single operator who is doing a reconnaissance task on, in a simulated battlefield. Uh, and conducting what's called RISTA scans, reconnaissance, surveillance, and target acquisition. And he either has uh, an automatic target recognition uh, process to help him, and he has uh, UAVs and UGVs, unmanned vehicle assets. We use a secondary change detection task to assess his ability to have good awareness of what's going on. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the concept, the, it, the uh, visual neuroscience and visual psychology has shown that our awareness of the visual world is actually quite fleeting. Uh, our ability to detect changes is, is despite our, our phenomenal uh, awareness of a continu continuity of the visual world, is actually quite limited. Uh, for those of you who know the work of Ronald Renzink, uh, one of his famous studies involved uh, a gorilla walking on stage, and if you're really focused on attending to me, you actually would miss that gorilla. Um, I'll, I'll try I was trying to get a demonstration of that, but I think I, I, that might be difficult. So change detection is, is a, a fairly sensitive measure of where a user's attention is focused. And we use a simple change detection test with just an icon on the situation map would move. Uh, and we would measure the, uh, the ability of the person to detect that or not. And this would then trigger automation help or not. The next slide, please. To test the efficacy of adaptive automation, we had three conditions, a, a manual condition in which the, uh, the operators are conducting uh, that, that's that reconnaissance task without any support, so-called static automation, where this automatic target recognition came on in the middle of the simulated mission, and an adaptive automation, which came on only if your change detection performance was not particularly good at that point. And so this is indicated by uh, the the, the the graphs that indicate when this automatic target recognition came on. And what you can see is in the red group, uh, it was, was triggered if your change detection indicated that your situation awareness was not, not up to a, 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 a particular threshold, the ATR would come on, but not if your change detection performance was fine. And we looked at what happened pre and post this adaptive change. Next slide, please. What this indicates is that we had various measures, both objective and subjective measures of situation awareness and workload. And what you can see is that compared to the manual conditions, both static and adaptive automation reduce workload and improve situation awareness. Uh, and the, the effect of adaptive automation goes beyond that of static automation. So while automation is helpful, automation that's tailored to individual needs is even more helpful. Now, these were based on behavioral and, and subjective measures. We were particularly interested in, in seeing whether we could find neural evidence to, in support of this uh, basis of using change detection performance to indicate uh, a cognitive status of the operator. And so we used EEG, or event-related potentials. The next slide. Uh, we know from a large uh, basis of basic research that attention enhances what a 
two basic components of the EEG known as the P1 and N1 components, uh, as shown here in the red. So when you attend to a stimulus, uh, you typically, within about 100 milliseconds, get a component that's known to be generated in extra stride cortex, which is larger than when your attention is directed elsewhere. And the topography of this attention effect has been, has been well studied. So we can use this as a proxy to gauge the effect of, of, of attention. The next slide, please. What's shown here is the event-related potential uh, or the P1 and the N1 components to this change detection probe that was presented in the situation probe. And what you can, you can also do a more sophisticated wavelet analysis where you do a frequency time analysis, but a simple amplitude measure uh, is, is quite sufficient. So the larger the P1 or the N1, the greater the effect uh, of, of the manipulation, the automation admission on the operator's attention or situation awareness. Next slide, please. And what this shows is that this is the P1 difference wave between um, when you're attending to the probe or not attending to the probe at, at two electrode sides of the back of the head. And what you can see is that you get, again, the similar effect that to the behavior where you have an improvement <coughs> in, in attention to the, to the uh, situation map in the static and, uh, condition compared to the manual condition, and this increases even further in the adaptive condition. Next slide, please. So just some conclusions. This is just one example of, the, of a kind of neuroergonomic study that might one want to do in a, in a fairly high fidelity simulation that we can use automation to support the operator, but if we can adapt it to, uh, to operator needs, in this particular case assessing their change detection performance, then we get much bigger bang for the buck. Brain measures of attention, indicated here by these P1 and N1 components, provide converging neural evidence uh, for the efficacy of adaptive automation. And I think of adaptive automation as, as sort of envisioning, uh, realizing Licklider's uh, vision many years ago of human-machine symbiosis. This is really where the, the automation is supporting the human rather than uh, directing the human, and you are also directing the automation when you need it. Next slide, please. Um, as Monty Python might say, and now for something completely different, I'd like to provide a second example, and this is just, you know, as I said, two of many examples that one could give of the kind of neuroergonomic research, and which is to the use of molecular genetics and proteomics to understand individual differences in cognition. Next slide, please. We, uh, this, the fact of individual differences has been alluded to in many of the talks today. And we know that individual differences reflect a number of different factors. Clearly, early development is important, experience is important, and training. Um, and genetic factors or so-called natural variation are only one factor. I don't want to rule out the importance of all of these other factors. People always ask me about, you know, have I found the gene for music? And uh, can you tell me how to how, how he trained Mozart? Well, Mozart probably didn't have a, a specific gene. It turns out that at the time of his first uh, <clears throat> concerto that, that was widely appreciated, it already had about five, hour, five years of musical expertise and training, which probably was a basis for his expertise. But leaving aside those factors, what can we learn about exceptional performance as well as normal variation? And can molecular genetics help us in that? And I'll just to give a couple of examples from recent research that, that we've been doing to try and understand both normal variation and also exceptional individuals, so-called cognitive superstars. Next slide, please. Here's a study uh, that I, I, a postdoc, Yang Zhang, and I did a number of years ago, looking at working memory, which refers to the ability to maintain um, information in mind and manipulate it in a temporary basis. We know from fMRI research, which is, which is indicated here, that an area of the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex works harder, shows greater uh, <clears throat> bold activity, blood flow activity, as the more items that you have to manipulate in working memory. And um, Eve Marder referred to the fact that we scientists always do means and standard errors. I don't show the standard error here, but I've fitted a linear graph to show that the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex works harder the more of these items that you have to keep in mind. And that this, in fact, is fitted with a fairly nice linear regression. But the mean and the linear fit 
hide a basic fact that there's large variability. Next slide, please. What you see here is that same graph shown for the 25 or 30 individuals who are part of this group. And what you see is that uh, the, the, the black curve shows the, the, the median subject, but there's in tremendous variability, particularly at the high end of the scale where you're keeping a lot of things in mind. And you get this green curve here. This is the, the oddball. This is the, you know, the outlier who doesn't obey the linear increase. And this, we call this subject seven. And keep him in mind, because he did not show, he showed a much lower level of activation of prefrontal cortex, and does not show this monotonic increase in activation that everybody else shows. Keep him in mind, because we'll come back to him. Uh, he turns out, he may turn out to be particularly interesting. Next slide, please. So what can molecular genetics tell us? Um, <clears throat> Uh, the, the unraveling of the ge genome, of course, has had a, a great impact, and the 20 to 25,000 genes uh, ha obviously, you know, ha have now been mapped. There's about 3 billion DNA base pairs. Uh, Dr. Ravinder and I referred to the fact that we, you know, that the worm only, we're not, we're not that more genes than the worm. We have maybe 10,000 or more genes. Um, perhaps we'd be more humble to realize that Yeast has at least seven to 8,000 genes. <clears throat> so the DNA alphabet consists of four nucleotides, uh, thymine, adenine, guanine, and cytosine is indicated here. And these base pairs come in different forms or alleles. And often the allelic variation is due to a single substitution. And as indicated here, you have a series of chains. And in one position, as indicated by, in red and T, you have a T to C substitution. And this is what's called a single nucleotide polymorphism, or SNP. And these occur roughly every thousand base pairs as you go down the DNA uh, chain. So there's many of these SNPs, and can we utilize our, our growing understanding of these SNPs to try and characterize normal variation between individuals? Next slide, please. The way, one way to do it is to use a candidate SNP approach, rather than looking at the entire genome, which is another approach. So what we have done is to use a combined bottom-up, top-down approach. We can, there are SNP databases, uh, which are maintained by, by NIH and a number of other organizations. We look to s identify SNPs that may have an impact on neurotransmitters in the brain and if actually modulate uh, proteins. And, and um, at the same time, using a top-down approach, we look at the cognitive function and we use fMRI and other data to try and identify which brain uh, areas may be the target for gene expression. And this way, we try and uh, identify particular SNPs that may be important in cognition. Next slide, please. Uh, so this, these are some of the gene SNPs that have been associated with cognition and identified in a review that's now about five years old. And they roughly fall into different categories, neurotransmitter genes, uh, such as those in the dopaminergic and noradrenergic uh, gene. And I'll mention one called DBH, or, or dopamine beta hydroxylase. Uh, and there's also genes that affect neuron health and plasticity in a more general way, such as PD, BDNF and APOEE4. There's now a growing understanding of the role of these different neurotransmitter genes and neurotrophic genes and their contribution to normal variation, not disease-related variation, but normal variation in cognition. Next slide, please. We've focused on the role of working memory, which I mentioned before, this ability to keep things in mind, which seems to be an important moderating factor in many complex cognitive functions, including decision-making, problem-solving, language processing, mathematical cognition. Uh, and we've, this particular example I'd like to show you is of this gene called DBH, or dopamine beta-hydroxylase, which is known to convert dopamine to norepinephrine in, in the brain. It may be <clears throat> selective for prefrontal cortex-dependent functions, such as working memory. And so we asked a couple of simple questions. Do individuals with different variants, different alleles in this gene, have uh, variation in working memory capacity? And do they also exhibit uh, differences in decision accuracy under time pressure? And I'll give you two examples. Uh, we started off with uh, <clears throat> a fairly simple task. The next uh, slide, please. And then went on to more complex tasks. This is just showing you the, the, the gene. It's found on chromosome 9. 
And you can see the little orange band expands out the, the gene. It's about 22, 23,000 base pairs long. And it has a number of different regions which are, which are translated out of the cell uh, nucleus. Uh, the particular ones are, that I indicated are on the two left, the minus 1021 CT substitution, which is involved in the greatest amount of enzyme activity. This is actually a functional gene that, in, uh, that its functional enzyme product also confusingly called dopamine beta hydroxylase, can be measured in cerebrospinal fluid or blood. And what we simply do is to look at the, the genotypes. So you can either have two Cs, uh, one C and one T, or you could be, have two Ts. And the particular uh, relationship between this gene and cognition and the uh, enzyme level in, uh, <clears throat> in blood can be measured. So we were interested to see what is the relationship between this function that has been linked uh, in animal research to, to human cognitive performance. Next slide, please. We started off with a very basic working memory task. This is what's called a spatial working memory task. You have a fixation point, and then you have up to three locations that, that may come up, only one, two, or three. Uh, and then they disappear, and there's a delay period. Uh, and this is what's called a delayed match to sample. And then you get a probe target, and you have to say whether it matches one of those locations or not. There's a large animal literature on this task, uh, which is another reason we chose it. Uh, the next slide, please. This shows what's plotted here is the accuracy of making those match uh, responses, how well your, your memory performance is, as a function of memory load, the number of target locations that you have to keep in mind. The first thing you can see is that the task is sensitive. That is, the, as the number of target detect, uh, dots that you have to keep in mind increases, performance goes down. But more importantly, there is a significant effect of, of the genotype depending on whether you're a CC or CT or TT, which can mean also be characterized as whether you have 0, 1, or 2 of the T alleles. And so the greater the number of T alleles you have, the higher the working memory performance. And this is particularly true even at the very high load where you have to keep three of these dots in mind and you're only doing it about 70%. But there's a significant impact both among so-called uh, homozygotes who have two TDs as well as heterozygotes who have one T and C. Next slide, please. So the question is, what is the mechanism by which DBH is linked to working memory? As I mentioned, it's known to be expressed in prefrontal cortex, but in other uh, areas as well. And the question is, is this a functional SNP? Many uh, SNPs or variants in genes are not translated out and so do not have an effect on protein regulation. This one is. So genes are, are particularly are of interest only if they're expressed and influence proteins particularly in the brain. And so one might call this a kind of cognitive proteomics, that is, can we link gene control proteins to function? Fortunately, the DBH gene, its enzyme product, dopamine beta hydroxylase, can be measured in plasma. And so we did this in, 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 in volunteers using uh, an assay which has been recently developed. Uh, and can I have the next slide, please? Um, <clears throat> the particular mechanism by which the, uh, the dopamine beta hydroxylase is thought to, this is uh, the work of Zabetian, suggests that if you have high levels of DBH, then norepinephrine receptors are active. But if you have low levels of DBH, dopamine receptors are active. And so you would expect a dopamine-related enhancement of memory under a low DBH level. Next slide, please. Which is what you find when you look at the effects of uh, the, the, gene, the, the genotype on the, the, the enzyme levels of this, this uh, dopamine beta hydroxylate in blood. What you can see is that the more T alleles you have, the lower the levels of this, this enzyme, which is associated with greater turnover of dopamine postsynaptically. And so the low DBH level is also associated with high working memory. Next slide, please. <clears throat> we then wanted to see whether we could use this assay to look at performance in a more complex task rather than the very simple working memory task. And so this is a, a, a simple battlefield command and control task that we developed some years ago um, under under support from Army Research Lab. 
and it represents a, a, a dynamic scenario in which the operator has to decide. What you see there are, are red enemy units, green friendly units, unknown yellow units, and then the blue is, the, is your artillery headquarters. And you have a number of decision rules as to uh, which, enemy, which unit should engage uh, the most critical enemy unit. You have automated support to help you, which is a, this is a very time-stressed task to, uh, to conduct. You literally have 10 seconds to make a decision. And uh, <clears throat> next slide, please. What this shows is that our relationship with working memory was uh, confirmed in this, uh, in this condition, both when you did the task without any automated support as, and as, as well as when you had automation. So those who had low dopamine beta hydroxylized activity as shown in the red, showed a significant reduction in decision time in this, in this more complex task. Next slide, please. Back to that oddball who didn't meet our, our expectation for an increase in, in prefrontal activity, activity. What do we know about him? He has very high verbal and spatial you know, uh, working memory, about four standard deviations above average. He can maintain attention at 100% accuracy for two hours. We gave him various sustained attention tasks. And he shows reduced prefrontal activation in fMRI and no increase with load in that working memory task, which is a very unusual, atypical. Um, so obviously, we were interested in his genetic profile. He has the TT genotype in, the, in this SNP that we've associated with high working memory and a very, very low dopamine beta hydroxylase enzyme level. And he has the lowest level of 100, 650 subjects that we've tested to date. Next slide. So what else we don't know about him? He's a male graduate student. He's high average but not superior IQ. He has good but not exceptional grades. I'm hoping that he'll stay in graduate school for the rest of his life so we can continue to test him. <laughs> he has a normal MRI. And so, um, I have his approval to show his MRI, but we haven't completely done a volumetric analysis, uh, for example, to look at dorsolateral prefrontal cortex or hippocampus, but so far there's no indication that he's showing any experience or genetic-related increases uh, in those areas, as was alluded to in Dr. Ravindranath's talk. And he's not an avid game, video game player. Actually, it's very difficult to find people in, in this age range who do not uh, show age-related um, uh, changes. Next slide. So <clears throat> dopamine beta hydroxylate gene is, is allowing us to understand a little bit more about individual differences in, in cognition as well as exceptional cognitive performance. Uh, next slide. We're doing a lot of other work to look at gene-gene interactions as well as gene-environment interactions. For example, the development of expertise in, in multitasking may be related to the COP gene, uh, which has been studied by Danny Weinberger. We're also looking at how aerobic exercise will improve executive attention in older adults, uh, depending on a particular uh, genotype that they may have. Next slide. Uh, a lot of the, the genetic work, as was discussed earlier, is correlational, but we can do animal studies, and so we're doing some collaborative work with gene knockout mice and RNA interference to see whether any of these genetic associations are actually causative or not. Last slide, I believe. So what is neuroergonomics? It's simply adding neuroscience tools to the armamentarium of the human factors or ergonomics researcher uh, who have tended to sort of stick their head in the this, in this sand like ostriches pretending that the neuroscience revolution hasn't occurred. It has, guys. Let's get on board and utilize it. You don't have, all have to do it, but we, we have to utilize em emerging knowledges. I've given you a couple of examples. Um, of where we can use neuroimaging and adaptive automation and molecular genetics, but there's a number of other ways in which we, we can use neuroscience. And I think neuroergonomics can lead to more effective and more natural interaction between humans and technology. Thank you.